Ah, ah hello, uh, good abend. Uh, Pleasure to have you here. Uh, let me quickly introduce you. Um, this is Jared. He works for Akamai uh, in the US, in Michigan, and is there pushing hundreds of terabits per, uh, by day. And I guess at home that didn't quite work out as well. And so he decided to take matters in his own hands and build his own small uh, ISP at his, uh, in Michigan. So Jared, the stage is yours. Thank you for being here. And I'm seeing you soon in the questions and answers. Thank you. Ah, yeah, yeah, really done. Uh, good night. Uh, ich heiße Jared March. Uh, ich wohne auf Amerika, im Deutsch, uh, nicht, nicht in Deutschland. So I had to start a telco or a fiber to Jared's house. Who am I? Uh, ich bin Jared March. Ich war im Austausch in Deutschland in 92. Uh, aber ich kann nur ein bisschen Deutsch sprechen, aber English is much better these days. Um, so, the, uh, you know, the uh, quick background. So, uh, I, I moved to my house where I currently live uh, in 2002. Uh, it was on the outside of Ann Arbor. Uh, the, my employer at the time, they provided me a T1 at home. Uh, 1.5 megabits was, uh, you know, was great uh, at that time, you know, in 2002, uh, you know, to have that symmetrical. Um, and around the town, there was, uh, you know, more development that, that, that popped up. Uh, you know, the, uh, the city was growing. Uh, and I expected that as broadband and technology advanced that, you know, something would eventually reach me. Either the uh, uh, cable company would, would build service to me, um, I would get DSL, uh, fiber to the home, but, but really nothing came. Uh, and after about two, you know, after many years, you know, I figured out that, you know, yeah, I was about two, you know, you know uh, uh, 3.3 kilometers away from the existing service area. Uh, and so, so yeah, so, so, so what do I do? So... Where do I live? I, I live west of Ann Arbor. No, no, really further west. Uh, I live out right here where this pin is. Um, you know, uh, I'm in America, so GDPR doesn't protect my location. But I do have, uh, you know, th th these photos that kind of show the development that that built up uh, in the area around me. And in the upper left hand corner, you can see like an entire neighborhood and subdivision uh, of homes that eventually got built. Um, you know, n not too far from me, about a two minute drive away from my home uh, out here. So I have this problem, uh, no high speed internet. You know, what, what's a, you know, a professional computer nerd to do? Uh, do you move uh, in the US? I, I don't know how it works uh, in Germany, but you know, in the US, the seller pays commission based on the sale price of the house. Um, so it, it would cost me a lot of money to move just in m money that I would have to spend uh, paying the real estate brokers. Uh, you know, so what did I do? I used a wireless ISP for, uh, you know, uh, for, you know, for a, a gap for a while. So what do I do? Uh, I actually go and I started a full telephone company. I had to uh, file a tariff and, uh, you know, who knows one day I might even profit from this enterprise. So lots of details go into building, you know, a fiber to the home network. Uh, you have to obviously get customers. Uh, you know, I lived in a place without good internet access, so I had to get that. Uh, in order to do all the construction, I've got to deal with contractors. I've got to get all the fiber and everything. So I spent spent years doing research on this, uh, planning, figuring out how to do the finances. Uh, I actually went and worked with the wireless ISP. Uh, my house was the hub for his network for uh, almost 10 years. Uh, and I actually started to connect his customers uh, to my house with fiber uh, in order to, to get some experience in, uh, in operating that. And originally started with active ethernet. Um, so when I, when I go online to order service, uh, you know, yeah, there's nothing good here. Uh, I tried to get, you know, um, AT&T and Comcast to build to my area. Uh, and you know, a few years ago, AT&T told me, yes, we have launched broadband in your area. You can now get 1.5 megabits per second. Um, which is of course horrible because that's what I had with the T1 many years ago. And I abandoned, uh, to go with the wireless ISP. Uh, and that didn't even, that wasn't even symmetric service. So I spent a lot of time researching what to do. Like I said, I played with active ethernet, uh, worked with uh, the Ubiquiti GPON solution. Uh, there's some drawbacks there. And I spent a lot of time you know, doing marketing efforts, talked to many people, uh, people who'd done similar things, similar efforts. Uh, I actually mailed you know, people letters. Uh, you know, I, I looked up who my neighbors were and sent them all letters and said, are you interested in this internet service? Um, you know, I, I talked to other ISPs who are doing fiber to the home. Uh, you know, community groups, 
you know, one of the local, one of the local, uh, you know, cities or townships uh, specifically went and uh, uh, decided to tax people to build broadband uh, in their area. And I, and I went and I studied, you know, what worked there, what didn't. Uh, because two different communities tried that. One of them succeeded and one of them did not. Uh, so it's very important to understand where, where the community is on, on these types of things. So, you know, like, like anything, you have to, you know, any business, you have to spend lots of money. Uh, so I purchased uh, my first Fusion Splicer in 2016. Uh, I purchased some fiber in 2017 uh, and OTDR in 2018. So I could, you know, diagnose what was going on with this network and, and really, you know, get, get some good experience with it. Uh, I spent a lot of money on, uh, you know, different permits uh, and things, uh, you know, having to file the tariff with the regulators, getting master plans. Um, in Michigan, we have something called the Mistig system, uh, which is for the utilities to come out and mark things. Uh, since I'm now a telephone company utility, I, I get emails every single day about somebody who wants to dig in their yard uh, and, and do stuff. And I have to figure out whether or not I have to mark and, and you know, put some flags out there. Uh, I filed for a permit in 2019, and it took almost six months for me to actually get a, a permit because we went back and forth uh, you know, on that. And that, pu that pushed my build into 2020, uh, which as many, you know, as we all know, is uh, the year of COVID. So, uh, you know, with the finances, we, you know, you really have to start small. I, a big thing that helped me was I spread out a lot of my costs over a long period of time. Uh, you know, obviously the construction costs are, are big at the end, um, but I found all of the, all of the little parts uh, that I needed, made sure I had the right underground supplies, splice enclosures and stuff. Uh, you know, my initial planning told me it was going to be about $60,000, um, and, and, you know, or more. Uh, I went and I, you know, leveraged money that I got, uh, you know, bonuses, uh, home equity line of credit, uh, you know, money from customers. Uh, and I went and I used a prepayment model copied from another uh, ISP that started out in the wireless business and started doing fiber as well. Um, and, and let people prepay for services. Uh, so you prepay, you get a service credit. Um, it stays with the house. So if the person moves, uh, they can get the, you know, they can sell, use that as a selling point, uh, you know, for doing that. And it really offsets, uh, you know, those, those upfront startup costs. And so I had a few people take advantage of that. Uh, I spent a lot of time developing spreadsheets that kind of showed what, you know, what everything was going to cost me to go and do everything. Uh, this is pretty close to what it cost me to build the fiber to my house was, you know, in month one, I would have spent about $140,000 uh, in the end. Uh, you know, it, it really, you know, when these things come along, they, they add up over time and you have to figure out, okay, how, how do you deal with this? And, you know, and wh where does everything come in? Um, and I also figured out, okay, if I add, you know, a reasonable number of customers a month, if I add two customers a month, where does that put me for profitability? Uh, you know, you really have to, if you're going to do a project like this, you really have to go and, you know, spend a lot of time estimating, you know, estimating and being realistic in what you can actually do, um, you know, just with the different speeds, uh, you know, how many customers you can actually hook, uh, especially because I have a day job and I have a family and, and many of those other dynamics. Um, you really need to understand what your costs are, how much time you're spending doing things. Um, you know, you have to really look at the full year of expenses uh, because some things only come up once a year or, you know, like the insurance or, you know, or different services. Uh, but, and you also have to forecast for unexpected expenses, you know, either repairs, additional equipment you might need to buy, uh, you know, uh, refunds you might end up giving to a customer because some situation has changed, uh, something like that. So, like I said, I worked with the existing wireless ISP. Uh, you know, I pre-wired the neighbors. I, you know, got together some racks some fiber distribution, patch panels and stuff, got that d installed down in my basement. Uh, you know, my customers, uh, they, they get two boxes on the home. They get a Microtik media converter, um, which has a SFP module in it. And uh, I also use a fiber, you know, a fiber termination box where we go in and we splice, uh, splice the fiber in there uh, to actually give them connectors and, and stuff, and then just run a patch, patch cord over to it. Uh, you know, on the right, there's the uh, fiber patch panel that's in my house. Uh, you know, where 
uh, I have a 24 I have a 24 count cable in this photo, but now I've got uh, a, a couple more cables that actually go out to the road. Uh, you know, from my house, I have a, I have some more patch panels uh, that I've built out. Um, typical customer installation is one of these Microtech media converters. Uh, I'm using the uh, U-Fiber Instant uh, as well as you know just some uh, armor patch cords. We do power over Ethernet from the inside of the house. Uh, and if the customer wants a wireless router, uh, I, I sell them a Microtech HAP AC2, uh, just because it's a cheap router uh, for me, and it and it works for most of the cases. And you can you can mesh them together, and you know, and you know, and it work they work relatively well. They're not they're not the best thing, but you know, for for many of these homes, uh, they actually work out. So here I am. I have uh, I have a couple vehicles that we own. Uh, you know, I know Germans. Uh, love autos. So this is a Toyota Prius uh, loaded up with uh, fiber supplies. Uh, they, they always got a good laugh whenever I rolled up in the Toyota Prius and was filling it up with, uh, you know, the, the hand holes and uh, various equipment uh, to put there. And, and here, here I am drilling underneath my driveway into, uh, you know, into a pit that we had pre-dug to put one of these boxes. Um, so finding the customers, uh, you know, I, my local area, we've got a cool tool called Map Washtenaw. I can get everything, you know, uh, from who owns the property, the shape of it, uh, and, and stuff. And I really, you know, I sent them stuff in the post, and that was really the way you had to do. Uh, that I had to go and, you know, contact these people because I don't know who they are, I don't know who lives there, uh, you know, and I had to ask them to put their trust in me. Um, you know, one of the things that happened from there is uh, in, in America, we have private roads. Um, you know, so if you live on, on a road and there's no other access points uh, to get into it other than from a main road, often those are that can be a private road uh, that are owned by the uh, all of the neighbors. And so I got invited to one of the private road meetings and they said, yeah, we'd love to have you bring fiber in. Uh, you know, and uh, I had about 70 percent of the home, I think 70 percent of the homes on that street signed up. Uh, for service, which uh, helped make it, you know, more palatable to to do internet access in that area. Um, you know, so for internet access, I found ACDNet. Uh, I didn't update this slide. I thought I had updated all of them. Uh, ACDNet, uh, I actually got them to enable IPv6. Uh, finally, at, uh, about a, two weeks ago or so, I also got my connection to 123Net up in the Detroit Internet Exchange. Uh, and I now have two slash 24s um, from Aaron as well as a slash 36 from Aaron for my V6 space. Uh, I was, I've been, it is still possible in the Aaron region to get, uh, you know, IP space if you're deploying IPv6. And when I realized that my DHCP pool was a slash 25, uh, that's when I really noticed I needed to add, uh, you know, to, to go and add some more, uh, uh, some more address space. So this is what my project looks like. I turned in the blueprints, like I said, in early 2019, got the, got the permit and had to hire some contractors. I, I really, it was important to have a good working relationship with them. Uh, I bought them food uh, to keep them happy. There are actually three brothers, um, you know, uh, that, that are working there. And so I don't know how many of you also have, you know, a couple family members and get along, but sometimes some days were better than others, but you know, I, uh, it was nice. I was a neutral party and was able to keep everybody happy and fed. Um, it's really important to consider like what, uh, you know, what people are going to do, uh, you know, what photos they're going to post and stuff on social media. Uh, because some, sometimes, uh, you know, you want to make sure that you understand if you're employing people as your contractor, what, what they're actually doing with that information. Uh, so nearby my house, there is a, uh, you know, about 18 inch, so half meter size uh, diameter natural gas pipeline that runs behind my house at a diagonal. Uh, and so we had to actually bore across that. Uh, and so we have, uh, you know, them out there with uh, basically this big uh, hydrovac uh, excavating the hole so we could find the pipeline. So to make sure that we don't break it because cutting, you know, a half meter pipeline would not be a not be a very good day at all for anybody. And the utility company actually is like, we're going to sit there and watch you the whole time you're working. 
Uh, and so I, I took a photo of this because I thought it was, you know, you know, it's interesting, but some days go really fast, but some days it's a lot of standing around and, uh, you know, complications because of the work being done. Uh, if you're going to do a project like this, there's always problems. Uh, there was this cursed corner. Um, my contractor lost about $10,000 worth of equipment underground at this corner, um, you know, trying to get, you know, just a hundred meters. Uh, because there is a, uh, there's a large, uh, drainage line, a water drainage line there, uh, that crosses the road at a diagonal. Uh, and there's a lot of other things. The, the yellow is natural gas. The orange is somebody's, somebody else's fiber optic line, uh, that runs there. And then the green is actually my line. Uh, and so we had to eventually get through all of those corners and get everything working. And what you can't tell is there's about a, uh, five meter drop right there as well uh, at that, you know, right there uh, where the water runs. So it, you know, it go gets very deep very quickly there. Uh, so my equipment, I have a really old, uh, you know, ditch witch drill. So I can actually go out and, you know, bore under people's uh, driveways. Uh, you know, the wireless ISP, he bought some equipment as well. He's, uh, he's still actively going out there and trying to convert people over to fiber. Uh, and so we, you know, we share some time and resources and equipment between each other. Uh, I have some equipment and he has some equipment, uh, and that works out well. Um, you know, so he, he owns this, uh, cable plow. I have the, the directional drill. Uh, you know, there's a photo of it from when I bought it, uh, and stuff, but something interesting happened along the way. So I'm borrowing the, this piece of equipment from my friend and it actually got stolen, uh, and it turned up in Chicago. So, you know. <laughs> uh, th th that is about, you know, 400, 500 kilometers away from, from where I live. Uh, so it, it, you know, it, it, you know, it turned up there. Uh, we were actually able to recover it from where it was, uh, you know, get the police involved and get it recovered. But this was something that was completely unexpected, uh, that happened. And, uh, you know, obviously I felt really horrible, uh, that that happened, but th there's a lot of things that you have to worry about, uh, when doing a project like this. I, I also received uh, a stop work order. Uh, they were unhappy with how many stakes I had placed in the right of way, uh, you know, uh, uh, along the way, uh, as well as uh, they, they said that we weren't notifying them enough in advance uh, from when we were doing work, um, when we had told them that, that we had started the project. Uh, and, and they wanted us to notify them every time we were out there, as opposed to just, you know, notify them when we started construction. Uh, so this, this surveying and staking of the right of way that, that added some additional money. Uh, I had to go and locate all the buried conduit, uh, before we had put any lines in there, um, you know, before, before they would allow us to resume working. Uh, and I also made employee badges for, uh, uh, for myself, my contractors and such, uh, because during COVID-19, uh, there were a lot of restrictions in place. Uh, I, I also had to go and purchase a, a fire hydrant connection to get water to, uh, for the contractor to run the directional drill machine as well. Uh, all sorts of other problems. Uh, around here, uh, they don't do a very good job of marking the utilities. Uh, you know, I would often, uh, often find them, they're buried only a couple of inches deep. Uh, you know, and you just, you just never know, uh, you know, what, what they're, you know, what they're doing. They don't always mark them. Uh, even though we call and we ask for them to, to go and do that, uh, as well as you can see this case where, uh, they actually wrapped the directional drill around some of the existing conduit, uh, that they had installed, um, just for, uh, you know, as part of my project, thankfully it wasn't somebody else's conduit. Otherwise that would have been a, you know, a big outage. So installing the fiber in the conduit is, can be very hard. As you can see, there's, uh, there's corn in the background of that one photo. <laughs> Uh, you know, this really is up, you know, out in the country. Um, you know, so you go and you, uh, you rent a big air compressor, uh, and I built my own fiber blower. I've actually had a number of people come to me and ask me for, you know, photos and parts, parts list for this. Uh, and with this, I was able to blow this, uh, this flat drop cable, uh, you know, almost, almost a kilometer down the conduit. Um, you know, without any significant issues, because before that I was using, 
uh, some friends and uh, in some cases, my children were helping me install the fiber in the conduit and uh, doing it by hand was very hard. Using this made it so much easier. Um, and this cost about, you know, $50 worth of parts. So after I get this all set, you start splicing, uh, you know, all the fibers. So you get out, uh, you know, I, I, I brought my own seating to sit on a bucket. Uh, you've got the good splice enclosures. I've got, uh, you know, splitters and stuff. And you, you start bringing all your supplies around uh, and go and install stuff in the conduits. Um, when I went to go contact my ISP and said, hey, I want to turn up, uh, I, I had a whole bunch of really bad splices, as you can see here. Uh, so I had to go through uh, and, and fix those. I, I still think I'm going to actually go back and fix a few more uh, now. W once I had re-spliced some of them, I got it to look a lot better, uh, you know, on the route. So this is, uh, you know, this is uh, much better. I need to get a better OTDR so I can test uh, on live services because this one won't actually test if there's something plugged in on the other end. Um, so as we all know, working with uh, telephone companies, ISPs, uh, you have a scheduled install. Uh, I know what I'm doing. I've been in this industry a long time. Uh, this should be really easy. Uh, it, it, it turned out to be more of a challenge than I thought along the way. Uh, you know, the tech, you know, the tech put the optic in the wrong DWDM system. Uh, you know, he, uh, they, when they initially tested the splice point where I was meeting them, they had tested it with a one gig optic with a 10 dB attenuator because the guy put it in the wrong system. He didn't remove any of the other stuff. Uh, and, and, and so that meant that I had light, but it wasn't very good light, um, and stuff. Um, you know, on top of that, when the he, the tech handed me an optic, he handed me a 10 gig LR and not the channel 44 DWDM one. Plus, the ISP wanted to give me CPE equipment, uh, and they wanted to give me uh, 6,500, which I politely declined to take in my house because I did not want to have, you know, such a large piece of equipment. Uh, you know, so once we figured all those details out, I drive up to the headquarters, uh, you know, Friday night, uh, you know, at uh, uh, you know at 1900, uh, go grab the, you know, hand them back their 10 gig LR optic grabbed the 80 kilometer optic, uh, visited a friend, drove home, plugged in the optic, and I got my link up, which is very happy. But, you know, I, you go, you start doing some pings. I'm looking at before, I have a 29 millisecond latency. Uh, after this, I'm about eight, uh, you know, much, which is much better. Uh, you start doing trace routes. I've got my latency reduction. You know, it, it, it looks really good once you, once you do this. So, what do I do? I was expecting a 10 gig. Um, they hadn't gotten me the right information for BGP yet. Um, you know, I, I'm now on plan B or C or something. So I grabbed an edge router X SFP. I plugged in the, you know, the one gig 80 kilometer optic. Uh, it can do NAT. And I started to go and NAT uh, everything through there. Um, oh, whoops. I went too far ahead. Uh, you know, th th this is my, uh, you know, slide for uh, Dave Temkin. Uh, although he's no longer at Netflix now, uh, you know, and after that, after I nap to the WAN IP, you know, I, I get a good speed test for the first time in a very long time. So after that, I got the people who were uh, pre-wired. I went and I took all the rate limiters off of them. I sent them a text message in the morning, uh, you know, uh, got everything swapped over to the 10 gig, uh, you know, got BGP up and working and everything got to be much better. It, it takes me a long time to do an install. Um, you know, the people who I pre-wired a year ago now, uh, they got connected in September. Uh, you know, I've, you know, my wife has had some medical issues in the past year or past half year or so. Uh, and so I've had to kind of pause some of the things that I, you know, pause installations and work every once in a while. Um, but, you know, it, it takes me about two to four hours to go and install a customer. Um, and, you know, it, it, or less than an hour if I did a whole bunch of the work back in the spring. But there's a lot of dependencies and a lot of splicing and just cable runs and everyone's house is different. So, so it takes some time. So total costs, uh, you know, I spent, uh, I, 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 you know, I spent about $126,000 doing stuff. Most of that was in the labor for the directional drilling crew. Uh, you know, I had all of the materials and everything. 
Uh, I spent almost $1,000 on the air, just renting the air compressor. It's maybe still cheaper than moving, uh, you know, in the long term, but now, now I have fiber. So customer status today, I have 37 customers online, uh, including one business customer. Uh, I've got 10 more who are still kind of in the process of being hooked up uh, because as I build out, uh, I'm now getting 100% uptake in homes I pass. Every home I pass wants uh, fiber at this point. Um, for 2021, I've got uh, you know another 13,000 feet uh, that I'm going to be building. I actually just got the permit for that. I think it was it was on Monday of this week, uh, and we're going to pass another 20 homes. Uh, and one of the people out there is actually paying for the build. Uh, they're they're paying basically the labor cost for the build uh, because they want the service, which is uh, quite a lot of money. Uh, I've uh, rearranged the network some. Uh, the active Ethernet customers are still on the Arista that I had. Uh, I, I now have the colocation in Southfield uh, at Detroit IX. If you happen to configure a router or or be there, uh, that'll work. I got my dual transits up. Uh, one, two, three net, they actually, their cabinet is on the side of the road. Uh, they just told me to go out and plug in my own optic uh, and fiber cable. Uh, you know, so I, so I actually made the connection at both ends for that one um, because they, they had some logistical challenges. Uh, and I, I've, I've swapped my routing to Juniper for the 5100 uh, at this point. Uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, kind of a network diagram. I'm going to swap out the, uh, the Arista with, uh, I have another 5100 uh, sitting over here that I'm going to, you know, uh, get mounted up there. And I'm going to swing over the uh, ACD transit to be redundant, separate from the, uh, uh, the EPL that I have back to the data center. Um, network usage. So uh, it's, it's still less than five megabits per subscriber. Uh, you can look at the graph here uh, and see when I added, uh, uh, you can see here where I added the wireless ISP fully onto my network uh, as a customer. Uh, he, he has uh, a little bit over 100 people who are downstream for me. So there, there's about 150, eh, almost 150 people-ish or so uh, that depend on me for internet access at this point. Uh, and then last week, I actually swapped out the optics and stuff so my graphs aren't quite contiguous because the router swaps and stuff. But because I'm at the internet exchange, uh, my transit usage has gone down significantly. So in this bottom right here, I actually have the inbound traffic at the, at the Detroit IX. So I'm pulling in uh, well, you know, I, well over half of my traffic over the, the IX through peering at this point, um, which is very nice. Uh, this is a latency reduction over time. So you can see uh, you know, loss and jitter when I was on the wireless network. You can see it improved on, uh, you know, on the fiber network. Um, I had some issues with, with the one provider not always telling me when there were fiber maintenances um, and stuff. You can see there, you know, uh, there were some issues, I think, with one of the ISPs there for a little bit or maybe the peering point between the networks. But you can also see when I added the, the second transit, uh, you can see the uh, the loss went down because of the you know the additional paths that are available. So I, I have too many people to really thank. Uh, you know, lots of people help me out. There's a guy Ryan Peel at Virgin's Fiber, Chris Fabian at LakeNet. Um, you know, all my reps, the wireless ISP, all my neighbors who are around me who have been very supportive, and people who've you know prepaid a year or more of service uh, to to get connected to me. Uh, and stuff, uh, you know, I've got my construction crews, you know, uh, the ISPs that were willing to meet me at a splice point, which is, you know, which is possible, but a lot of ISPs don't like to do that. Uh, you know, I have lots of friends who help me along the way. Um, there's some Facebook groups where you can actually get a lot of helpful information. People will, will help you out there, uh, you know, either doing wireless or fiber, uh, you know, and, and really interesting stuff there. So, I'm at the end. Fraga, bitte? Well, thank you, Jared. Um, we actually have quite a few questions. And I think the, the most voted one is uh, how you handle all the upcoming support, I guess, not only if something is broken in, in case of an incident, but also, I guess, you have quite a bit of end-user support going on. Is there a community growing? Do you have uh, external support office, or how, how's it going? 
Uh, no, I do all the f support myself uh, right now. So uh, they they can make a, a phone call or a text message to me uh, to, to get support right now. Um, because I have a small number of customers, I have them all programmed in my phone with customer and then the name. Um, but for the most part, I'm not having, uh, I, I'm not really having major issues. Like people are usually like, oh, oh, I had problems with the video quality, but it's only, it's only on YouTube TV. Like all the other services are fine. And so it, it's usually, you know, a five, 10 minute call. Um, I, I did have one house where the dog chewed on the, the cat five that was on the outside of the house. Uh, so I had to go and replace that. Um, but I was able to do that in less than an hour <laughs> from when they called me. So, so that, that was pretty good. Um, I did have a, a, you know, I have had, uh, unplanned maintenances where that caused customers to go and, uh, message me usually from my upstream. Uh, but I have also, you know, when in working on stuff, I've bumped cables and stuff and caused issues. Uh, but I, for the existing customers, I spend less than, less than 30 minutes a week uh, supporting them. Uh, and, you know, on average, th there may be one that takes a little bit longer or something, but uh, because I've got the wireless ISP as well, um, who depends on who depends upon me, and he's also doing fiber. Uh, you know, I was at, I was at something yesterday, I was able to text him and have him go and look at something for me. Uh, so, so I'm able to go on vacation if I need to. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Um, one other question that came up is uh, when you started this starting and, and the like haven't been around, do you think this would still be something where you could could still start if now Starlink and other, I'm not going to push uh, put Starlink here, but OneWeb or whoever uh, manages to, to acquire a customer base is still something you would see realistic? Yeah, I'm, I, have a, I have way more interest. Like I, I'm not advertising anymore because I don't have enough uh, I don't have enough time to install everybody who's, uh, you know, around me. So I need to, I need to make some big decisions of, you know, at what point do I, you know, I don't have enough work for it to be a full-time thing, but do I want to, do I want to, you know, train and hire somebody to pay on contract to, to help support me for some of these things? Um, just because it'd be nice, to, you know, it'd be nice to, you know, not have to go out to, you know, to everybody uh, and do stuff. Like I said, it takes me about four hours to do a full install, you know, from splicing the fiber at both ends, getting it prepared to go in the splice enclosure, um, mounting the media converter on the house, like mounting the boxes on the house and stuff, and then coming back and burying the line with the equipment. Like it, it, it takes a lot of time. I don't, and I don't have to, none of those are things that are special that I have to do. It's just being a small bit, you know, being a small company, uh, you know, you end up doing everything, you know. All right. Um, one more question was uh, why you went for underground fiber, because um, at least some of us seem to know that in the U.S. aerial fiber, so fiber on poles uh, running through the county is, is something that is typical. Is there any, any reasoning for that? Yeah, it was actually, so there's two reasons. Um, one of them is there weren't poles along the entire route. Um, which is the reason why nobody else had done it is that there was about uh, almost a, there's almost a kilometer where there's like three houses, <laughs> um, you know, for, you know, in one kilometer or may maybe less. And so, and there's no poles that go through there. I actually, the small area I have of customers around me, uh, there's three different electric grids that intersect by me because I can tell because I see when there's power outage for the one people and the other people, I can actually see them in my OLT. Um, <laughs> so b the poles don't connect all the way. Um, and then you also end up in a position where you have to pay, uh, uh, you have to actually pay rent to the pole owner and you have to pay a bunch of permit, a bunch of fees. And the challenge with that is, uh, that those fees can, it can basically make it the same cost as to build underground. And so if I'm going to spend the money, I'd rather build it and have it be underground. And, and there's a lot more protection for that because if, if, the, if I don't own the equipment to go up and work in the air on the lines, uh, and so, it, and it, to pay a contractor to fix that is about $8,000. If it's, uh, 
you know, if it's late, you know, these things never break when it's convenient, when it's like nice and sunny and everything. Uh, it'll break in the middle of the night in a rainstorm. And, you know, the, the estimate I got was about $8,000 to do a, you know, to do a, a repair. Um, so it, 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 like once, once you weigh all the costs, uh, underground was actually cheaper. That's, that's interesting that you put the uh, outages as, as a scope because we have quite a lot of questions regarding your expectation about outages. What kind of SLA can you offer or are you offering? Um, what happens in case uh, if if you breach your SLA, are you going to go bankrupt or whatever? Or is there just no SLA? Can you elaborate a bit on that? Yeah, yeah. There's no SLA. I mean, if, if you're unhappy, <laughs> if if you're unhappy, I'll give you your money back, basically. Um, you know, it, because I am like the unfortunate thing is I I have no competitors. Like I am I am the only option, and so you basically are getting like somebody who actually cares about the quality of the service, um, as as the guy who's delivering you service. And I also I don't have a goal of profit. Um, which is, I think, very different. Like, I just need it to not cost me money. Um, w which is made so, like I've had I've had the company come and try and buy me twice uh, already, and it's an interesting conversation because they're like, uh, I'm like, yeah, like it's not co it's not costing me any money. Basically, everyone else is paying for me to have internet access at this point, and I have two 10 gigs at my house. So if it's not costing me money, and I'm spending you know, maybe 30 minutes a week, aside from dreaming of like the new, like what new areas I might build to. I have, I have a map on the wall behind me where yeah, I mark it up with people who are interested in stuff, but. Yeah, it's, yeah, I think it, there's, there's way more sympathy, sympathy for someone like you who actually cares, cares about the service. The so that is great. great. Um, um, I think I, regardless of this, there's one more question regarding how many legal issues that I had, I don't know, DMCA takedowns or criminal investigations or anything. Is there anything like that happened yet? Or do you have all very nice neighbors? Um, so, so far zero, except for, except for this one uh, very bad user. So there happened to be a guy who configured an edge router X SFP to be his CPE and he didn't delete the de default uh, UBNT account <laughs> when he did that. <laughs> and yeah, so, and so that on. actually got, uh, uh, that got compromised and then I had to go fix it. Uh, but thankfully that was, that was the one for my house. So very embarrassing, but it happens. Yeah, obviously. Uh, I also had one ubiquity uh, switch with default credentials in the internet and those things get pwned very fast, so <laughs> I can could truly relate. Uh, yeah, it, it's it, it you know, it th th those devices are very hard to automate. Whereas I'm very happy with the Juniper and the Arista boxes, where you can actually template some configuration and put up put up f uh, firewall rules. So I guess your ISP has better automation than most other medium sized ISPs. Uh, I, I mean, cut and paste works the same as uh, on my computer as everyone else's. <laughs> all right. I think that's, that's a wrap up for all the questions we have. Thank you so much for taking the time. It's a great effort and it's great to hear your story. I'm hope, it, hoping it inspires someone else here in, in our communities. Maybe we can see uh, more small ISPs going up all over Germany and you will be to blame. So <laughs> thanks for that. And I uh, hope to see you around for the social later on if, if you have time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I will try and show up. Awesome. Then All thank right. you very much. Um, yeah, being done. We'll switch over to German in a second. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, give us a short break to uh, do some build up. And then we will switch over to Christian. And yeah, see you in a second.